Good morning, everybody. Are you having a great conference so far? Yeah. I thought so. Last night in the lobby, um, that was some terrific networking and, and imbibing last night. That was a lot of fun. In fact, it was so fun that we were reluctant to actually bring everything to a halt and stop all that terrific conversation and thank our sponsors. And I want to do that now. Uh, Blackboard sponsored that event, and uh, we want to make sure they uh, get uh, the recognition for doing that because. Um, without the support of folks like, like Blackboard, we just can't really put on these events and have them as be as successful as, they, as they've been. Um, I'd love for the Blackboard representatives who are here to stand up if you could and be recognized. Could you please stand if they're here? Okay. Thank you. I encourage you to meet with the representatives from Blackboard and to stop by their booths um, to talk about their services and also the things that they're now doing with us in partnership with the Center for Research and Consulting. We're really excited about that new partnership. Um, now I'm going to just introduce um, the programming co-chair from Oregon State University, Simona Bochak. All right, good morning everyone. Like Bob said, my name is Simona Bochek with Oregon State University Extended Campus and I am this year's programming co-chair along with Stephanie Stiles from uh, UC Irvine. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention before I introduce our next speaker is that if you are really loving this conference, um, if you have any input about this conference, um, we encourage you to come talk to us about serving on the planning committee. So we are a pretty awesome team of people from all over the US and Canada, and we meet and we plan this conference um, that we put on for you. And so we're always looking for volunteers to serve on the planning committee. If you think you have those, that sort of skill set and that sort of voluntary spirit, and you want to come talk to us, um, just find either myself or Stephanie over here or any of the planning committee members and just drop off your business card, and we will definitely hunt you down after this conference to talk to you about volunteering. And uh, we will tell you all the ins and outs of what it's like to be on the planning committee, what's involved, and what's in it for you as well. So this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing um, this morning's keynote speaker. So do you wish you better understood today's emerging generations? Have you ever wanted to know what it takes to successfully lead or communicate across today's generations? Um, our speaker today has spent the last six years as a millennial speaker and is the author of the book, The Gen Edge, How to Leverage Millennials with the Next Generation Mindset. He has shared the stage with fellow thought leaders from iconic brands like MTV, Facebook, and Uber, and he runs an internationally recognized blog and podcast at nextgenerationcatalyst.com. When he is not speaking and writing, you may find him misspelling words in text messages, attempting to be an average golfer, and religiously cheering on the Denver Broncos with his wife and yellow Labrador from their home in Atlanta, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming speaker, author, and craft beer lover, Ryan Jenkins. Good morning. All right, guys, quick question for you, and I want the first word that comes to mind, okay? I, want, I mean, I'm unfiltered, the first word. Can you guys do this for me? Okay, when I, when I shoot this phrase up on the screens, I want the first word that comes to mind, and just shout it out. You guys with me? So what is the first word that comes to mind when you hear today's generations? Now shout it out. Let's hear it. Digital natives, what else? Soccer trophies, yes. <laughs> what else? Entitled. Entitled. We didn't take long to get there. Indulgent. Indulgent. Interesting. What else? Spoiled. Spoiled. Is this the millennial hating group that, that I just walked into? What's up? Millennials, we got to represent here. Entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurial. I love it. Independent. What'd you say? Committed. Committed. Yeah, I love that. What else? All yes. Poor. Poor. Hmm, yes. All true. What else? Smart, lost. Smart, lost. Green. Green? Interesting. What else? I'm sorry, what, what was that? <laughs> you guys are all it's talking at the same time. What, what did you say? College loans. College loans. Here we go. Any, was there another Innovative. one? Over here? Innovative. I like you. I like you. What, anything else? 
service still living with mom and dad, yes? ADD. A ADD. What's that? ADD. Okay. Uh, that was part of the ADD. Like, I couldn't... Okay, anyway. Anything else before we... Tumblr. I like that. Any Tumblr fans? Any, any Tumblr users in the house? Okay, all right. All right, well, guys, um, I know we just met. My name's Ryan. I'm your friend. <laughs> but I pulled a fast one on you. And don't beat yourself up, because this happens to every, every audience that I do this exercise with. Now, when I asked you about today's generations, I would say about 80% of your responses were towards which generation? The millennials. I didn't say millennials. I didn't say any of that, right? But that happens every time. And why I think that happens is because the most friction is with that generation. The most question marks is with that generation. And so that's why I'm here today. We're going to talk about some next generation marketing. So I'm going to kind of debunk, kind of, kind of really give you a clear understanding of who this generation is and why they've become who they've become and all the words that you said today, why they've become that. And so we're going to have some fun. Um, hopefully, hopefully we're going to have some time for some Q&A at the end. But if we don't, uh, my email's up there, so feel free to shoot me an email with any questions, or if you just want to say, sup, uh, you can email me at rj at ryan-jenkins.com. And then all of these slides are available for free for you guys at ryanislive.com, and you can pull those up on your mobile device, scroll ahead, and be the number one person in the class because you know all the answers, okay? All right, now a couple things before we really dive in here, and this is really important. I want you guys to hear me on this. Really important. I don't want you to listen to anything that I have to say. Yeah, you heard me that. You're, you're like, wait a minute, you're the guy with the mic. They just did the intro. You're on stage. You got the clicker. Yeah, I don't want you guys to listen to anything I have to say. What I want you to do, big difference here, what I want you to do is listen to what you hear. And I think that should, that should go across the whole conference, right? Because all the stuff you're about to see is not going to fit neatly in a box for every one of our situations. We're all in different generations. We're all different, from different universities. We all live in different parts of the country. We all have diverse teams and situations. But there are going to be certain things that resonate with you. There are going to be certain things that maybe you resist. And those are the things you need to hyper-focus on. OK? So that's one thing. The second thing, my favorite quote, I think of all time, is by Oliver Holmes, who said, a mind once stretched never regains its original dimensions. We were just talking over here before the, before the event um, of just how much, how much it helps to put yourself in these environments to stretch your thinking, right? To, to hear from someone that's not necessarily involved in higher education, because that's what's going to stretch your thinking. That's what's going to help you innovate. So when you guys leave those doors after our session, I just hope that you're thinking differently. All right? And then uh, finally, the last thing I want to say is, if at any point, too, if you say, Ryan, uh, that's common knowledge, we all know that, move on, I want you to catch yourself, catch yourself in that thinking, and ask yourself the follow-up question, is it common practice? I think we're all guilty of that, right? We know certain things, we know all these things, but are we putting it into practice? And then finally, I want to welcome you guys to Atlanta. This is my hometown, so I hope you guys are enjoying it. Um, and I'm originally from Denver, so go Broncos. And Yes, all right. It's America's team. I know, I know. I love it. <laughs> and I'm a proud graduate of the Miami University of Ohio. So, Kimbler, we've got to represent today, right? Right on. All right, guys, so let's jump into generations. Let's talk. Well, well, here's the agenda. We're going to talk about generations. I'm going to give you three millennial marketing truths, three millennial marketing trends, and then three millennial marketing to-dos. And for all you enrollment folks out there, I think you're going to gain a tremendous value from this as well, uh, because I think at the bare minimum, you're interacting with this generation, right? So I think the more you understand them, the better you'll be able to connect with them, work with them, parent them, or lead them. OK, so let's jump in to the generations. Here's a quick snapshot of the generations. The middle column is the age. And on the right side there are the numbers. And that's how large that generation was at their peak. So you notice two asterisks on the bottom right corner of those, the last two generations. Those generations aren't that large anymore, unfortunately, because many members of that generation have passed away. But that's how large they were at their peak. And so you'll notice, at 80 million strong, the millennial generation is the largest generation on the planet. Now, uh, another quick question, and just shout it out if you think you know the answer. 
Do you guys know what the average life expectancy was in 1902? 40 something, yes, whoever said that, super close, nice. Um, yes, the average life expectancy in 1902 was 47 years old. Any guesses on what the life, average life expectancy is today? 77, that's pretty close. 80, someone said 85, 86, yeah, it's over 80 at this point. And so we've just about doubled our life expectancy in, in about 100 years, pretty incredible. Now, and two, they've, they've said, too, that now one in four people will live to be over 100. Can you guys believe that? I usually get a totally mixed reaction when I say that number. Some people literally will look at their watch and roll their eyes. It's amazing. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that realization for you. It is what it is. But why I think those numbers are, are, are key, right, is because as medicine advances, as technology advances, we, are, we will be living longer. So it's very realistic that not only will we be you know, leading, communicating, marketing to four different generations in the marketplace, but it could be five, six, seven, maybe eight. So I think it's, 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 it's fundamentally helpful for all of us uh, to understand these generations. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to kind of unpack um, a lot of this. And I will say before I move on, generations are a clue. They're not a box, but they're a clue. Okay? And I think in my experience, in my, my, my opinion, they're a very big clue on how we market to them, how we connect with them, how we lead them. Okay, so here's a quick snapshot of the 2014 workplace. Millennials make up a majority of the workplace. And any guesses what percentage of the marketplace will be millennials by 2025? Just shout it out. Someone said 70, that's super close. Now, I, now, when I show you guys this stat, I don't want you running out of the room, all right? Will you guys just hang tight with me on this? 75% of the workplace will be made up of millennials. Yeah, don't all scream in unison, I know. Now, this quickly will erode as the next generation comes into the workplace, but I think this is key in, to understand because um, life phases and how we approach marketing and how we connect with this generation is going to be very different when they're, when they're coming into the workplace or they're you know, thinking about coming into the workplace. All right, I want to give you guys a couple statistics to put some context around this generation, and specifically these are catered for your industry. 50% of millennial, of millennials college students say they don't need a physical classroom. Absolutely, they're digital natives. Statistic number two, 63% of millennials have a bachelor's degree, making them the most educated generation ever. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't say the smartest generation ever just the most educated. And by the way, uh, for all of those playing at home, I am a millennial myself, so I can take some jabs, I think, with some credibility with this generation. Uh, but if at any point, if I'm, if I'm up here and I stop mid-sentence and I just collapse right in front of you, don't be alarmed. That's why I'm telling you this in advance, don't be alarmed. It's more than likely it's because it's been over an hour since I've texted somebody. <laughs> so <laughs> I need some grace on this. So, Front row, or, or Kimberly, if I fall over, just lob me a mobile device and we'll, you know, give me a couple seconds, all right? I hope you guys will do that for me. Okay. And the last statistic here, 39% of millennials believe that the future of education as being more digital. Again, I think we all understand these trends. We see the train coming, but I think it's helpful to really put some numbers behind it. All right, now I want to take you guys through the, the journey of one millennial to really understand how they've evolved to become who they are. And again, I think this will help you, you know, as marketers, we want to understand the psyche of those that we're trying to connect with. So I think this will be uh, extremely helpful. So we're going, to take, we're going to walk through the journey of one millennial. We'll call this individual Millennial Mike. And his journey begins in 1988. He was born, and, and contrary to popular belief, he did not have earbuds permanently in his ears when he was coming into this world. But in 1988, he, was, he came into this world, and we're going to fast forward to the year 2000. Millennial Mike is in middle school, and this is when he first hears about online chat rooms. And him and his buddies are like, this is cool. And so after school, they go home, they create a, an account, you know, they deal with the really fast speeds of dial-up modems. <laughs> You know, that bizarre sound, we all remember that. They created an AOL username and they began chatting with people around the country and around the world. So the point here is that millennials um, have never had to adapt to technology 
It's just all they've ever known. And people say, Ryan, millennials, oh, they're so tech savvy. Oh, it's driving me crazy. And I'm going, no, 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 they're not tech savvy. Millennials are not tech savvy. They're tech dependent, right? They grew up with it. It's part of their DNA. All right, so let's move now to, to year 2001. Millennial Mike, still in middle school. His online behavior moves from on, uh, in online chat rooms to instant messaging. Perhaps this is the birth of multitasking, talking with multiple friends online. And this is the year we lost our privacy. I don't know if you guys knew this. This, this was the official year that we all lost our privacy. Uh, not really, but you know, hopefully you kind of understand um, some of the privacy and why this generation has lower privacy barriers than most. Um, but a lot of the offline conversations they were having with friends began spilling online. And vice versa, private online, what they thought was private online conversations, kids would print off those conversations, bring it to school, and show everybody, right? And so what we learned from this is that the millennials value transparency. They were transparent on the web and on the internet from day one, right? And so now they pull that into the marketplace. They want leaders to be transparent. They want the employers they go to work for to be transparent. And they want the brands that they buy from to be transparent. So that's going to be a theme throughout today is transparency. All right, let's move forward to 2003. Millennial Mike is now in high school, and guess what? He's got access to Google. Can you imagine? How many, how many of you had access to Google while you were in high school? Raise your hand. <laughs> we got the straight-A students back there, right? What are you guys doing back there? You should be front rowers, right? Straight A's. Uh, I did not have access to Google in high school. Um, it wasn't until college, but even if you didn't raise your hand, if you were in high school and you had access to Google, come on, let's be honest, you would use Google for everything, wouldn't you? You'd use it for the legwork of all of your research. So of course, that's what Millennial Mike did. He used Google for everything, to read any Wikipedia for everything. And so what we've learned here is that the Millennial generation is the first generation ever that doesn't consider parents or their teachers as the authority but rather they consider what the authority? The Google, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the internet. They consider the internet as their authority. And this, this, this demographic, the millennial generation, attacks problems and solves problems fundamentally different than their elders because of this hyper-connected uh, hyper upbringing they've had. All right, 2003 was also the year that Millennial Mike joined his first social network, which was one of the initial ones. Someone said it over, MySpace, yeah. Who still got their MySpace account? I'm curious. <laughs> Nobody? All right, it might be making a comeback. J Justin Timberlake bought it, right? It might be like this music thing. Keep an eye on it. Um, yeah, so MySpace. So he couldn't do Facebook yet. Facebook, at the, Facebook launched in 2003, but it was uh, college only. And, that, and so he's still in high school. So, but... 2005, he's not, Millennial Mike's a senior in high school. 2005 was the first year that Facebook went from college only to include high school. So you better believe it. He, Millennial Mike was on Facebook, created an account, and immediately, like, as soon as he hit entered to log in for the first time, he gained thousands of friends. It just, just happened like that. Friends is what we, right? Friends. And so the, the Millennial generation, they've always been early adopters. Right? Whether it came to instant messaging, online chat rooms, AOL, Facebook, Google, all that, they've been early adopters. And so um, we learn a lot about that through Facebook. And, and really, they use social media as a tool. Right? So Millennial Mike, he joined Facebook, and he began interacting. He joined a group of other uh, incoming freshmen to the university he's about to attend. And he begins making friends, he begins networking digitally. And lo and behold, he finds a roommate. Right? So they were using it as a tool to connect with people. All right, so let's move forward now to 2007. He's now in college, and his parents buy him a cell phone. And he, of course, he wanted the iconic device, which, which was the iPhone. Yeah, the iPhone came out in 2007. And so his parents bought it for him, as probably I'm sure many of you bought them for your children, really for safety and logistical purposes. <laughs> right? So that's how it started, at least. But. As soon as Millennial Mike's parents gave him that device, they immediately regret it when they got that first bill. Right? Why? 
because of texting. Yes, Millennial Mike discovered texting. Again, early adopters, they crave and lean into technology. Yeah, so texting T9 style. Who remembers T9 style texting? Yes, the throwback. Love it. Okay. All right. Oh, 2000. Um, let me go back. Oh, 2000. And this 2007 was the first year that the Americans, all of us, uh, sent and received more text messages than phone calls. So that was a pivotal year for all of us when it comes to communication. Again, technology being a very uh, being a disruptor. All right. Now, in 2008, Millennial Mike um, begins thinking about a personal brand. Right? He's slowly maturing. And he looks to Twitter. Twitter originally started as a microblogging platform. People could throw in their ideas. They would just talk about anything that came to mind. They would um, contribute their, their passions or just ideas. And that's how Twitter started, it's since molded from there. But Millennial Mike looked at blogging as a way to contribute. The internet gave them a voice from day one, and they've, want, they've contributed to it. They've want, wanted to have an impact and have a voice. And so they pull that now into the workplace and the marketplace. They want to have an impact from day one. Right? They want to be heard. They want to have a, an opinion. They want to lean in. All right, 2009, Millennial Mike is now a senior in college, and he's about to get a job. What does he have to do before he gets that job or start interviewing? Some of you millennials probably know what you did. But before he does anything, he's got to go to Facebook and ask all of his friends to detag him in every single one. <laughs> Of those darn spring break photos, right? You gotta clean that up before he. Um, but he also looks to LinkedIn. He begins building a profile. And so at this point, uh, what we kind of learn from here is that the millennials, um, they, they, they grew up in the age of networks, right? So they have massive, uh, massive social networks because they've been pioneering, they've been involved in it since day one. And so they look to their social networks to learn where should I live, what should I eat, what should I do after school, should I go back to school? They, they, and they, they look to their peers for that type of information. And so that takes us today. They're, they've infiltrated the marketplace, right? They've infiltrated our workspaces. Um, and I think this, hopefully this slide is helpful, right, to really give you some context on how, they, how the millennials came to be. And I will tell you, they're not trying to piss you off on purpose, okay? <laughs> It's just they've had a hyper-social, hyper-connected, high-tech upbringing, right? So it's made them a new, a different breed of human, really, right? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's helpful to understand this. All right, before we move on, if, if there is one thing I can give you to, to take away from this slide, it's this one thing. This is really important. Um, AOL is to blame for everything. <laughs> That's what you need to take away. I know some of you are like, I want to blame someone or something. It's AOL. All right, last slide here on the millennials. Millennials are critical mass of change agents. So critical mass, right? A critical mass is when you have enough of something, it finally tips the scale. Social media is a perfect example. It was create, uh, social media was created by a millennial, a.k.a. Mark Zuckerberg. It was, um, it was accepted and adopted by millennials, and then it's gone mainstream because of millennials, right? We've all... We've probably all been on, interacting with multiple social media accounts just this morning. So it's something we all do now. And so um, people always ask me, well, Ryan, why is today different? Generation gaps have always existed, and that's so true. It just every, every younger generation just seems there seems to always be some friction. And baby boomers, when you came into the marketplace, massive disruption, right? Just because of your sheer size. But why today is different and why it's so important uh, to, to, to gain, to understand this, is for two reasons why today's different. Technology and the internet, right? That's the greatest equalizer. So you have technology and the internet coupled with the largest generation on the planet, and that's the recipe for the massive, massive disruption. Right? And that's why we're here. That's why we're trying to learn. We're trying to get our hands around social media and what's next, and how does this new generation affect how we do our work and workplace, communicate and market. Um, and technology, really, it's, 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 it's fundamentally changed uh, behaviors, and it's inspired new values that just have not existed before. And so oftentimes, I'm, 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 I'm torn that I'm not sure this is a millennial thing. I'm not sure this is a generational thing. I think we're just living through fundamental culture shifts. Right? And we all experience this today in, in our jobs and in the world and, and consumer life. There is so much flux, there is so much change. And really, I use the millennials really as a benchmark, kind of as the illustration of how much change is ahead of us. 
And I think all of us, including myself, were just grossly, 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 grossly underestimating how much change is ahead of us. And I think it's exciting, right? If, we, if, we're, if we're on the cutting edge, we understand that and we're open and agile with it. But we need to understand this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much change ahead. Okay. Let's move on. All right, so hopefully you guys got some good context uh, around the millennial generation. So let me give you three millennial marketing truths. So we're going to start with the first uh, statistic. 60% of millennials are engaged with rating products and services. So that leads us to truth number one, which is millennials want to be active consumers. Right? Remember, remember the, the millennial mic coming up. They, ha they have... Uh, They've been engaged on the social web. They've had a voice from day one. They want to, to have an impact. They want to contribute. And the best example from this uh, that I think is Lay's. Lay's has a campaign called Do Us a Flavor. Uh, clever, right? And so they actually open it up to everyone. Everyone can submit and create their own flavors that they want. And so these are the final, these are the final four in 2014. We've got Lay's Cappuccino. Interesting. Lay's uh, wasabi ginger, Lay's bacon mac and cheese, and Lay's uh, mango salsa. So the winner this year, the 2014 winner, was ginger wasabi. But again, it's this idea, right, of opening up crowdsourcing innovation, crowdsourcing. Uh, it's this idea of creating an engagement strategy that involves collaboration and co-creation. Right? If you can get your millennials involved or your target market involved in co-creating with you, uh, that'll be a win. All right, let's move on to truth stat number two. 95% of millennials say that friends are the most credible source for product information. So that leads us to truth uh, number two. Millennials are massively persuaded by peers. Right? They have ro very robust social networks, and they lean into those. They use those to understand what they should do, where to live, what to eat, all that stuff. And the best example I think of this is MTV. MTV actually, uh, they also subscribe to kind of this co-creation engagement strategy. And they actually have 300 US millennials that they tap into and they help, they use those millennials to help them create and, sh and shape their programming. And then they turn around and they leverage those millennials to then, then their social networks to help them influence their peers on what to watch. And so this strategy has been so successful recently that one of the recent video music awards for MTV, uh, ratings increased by 26%. So a fundamental uh, thing to kind of keep in mind here is millennials get millennials. So if you're trying to recruit this generation, use millennials. If you're looking to create social media strategy to market, you may want, I'd highly recommend using millennials and that strategy. All right, uh, truth number three. 78% of millennials would rather spend money on a desirable experience than buy coveted goods. I think that's really, uh, really, um, really lands home for, for, for y'all in, in your industry. So that leads us to truth number three, millennials desire unique experiences. Right? They grew up in an age of, of customization and they, they grew up in an age where they could get everything at Google. Right? The world is at their fingertips. So what they're really interested in is offline unique experiences. They want that one-of-a-kind thing that they can go out and experience, and then they're going to go blog about it and tell other friends and tweet and pin it and whatever else, right? So how, how can you find ways to infuse more of a unique experience? And I always say the wackier the better. Wacky works with millennials. Um, the best example here is Catalyst. I don't know if any of you have been to a Catalyst conference. It's a conference for, for young leaders. And every year they do this really unique thing. At their, they, they, they break some obscure Guinness Book World Record. So they bring together tens of thousands of people. And one year it was the largest pillow fight ever recorded. Right? They just gave out pillows. And, uh, one year it was the, mo the, most, uh, the most people to sit on a whoopee cushion simultaneously. They broke a world record. And I, got, I went to the conference one year, and it was a year they broke the world record for the highest belly flop dive. Uh, this guy's been on David Letterman, but I think it was over 100 feet. He jumped into a baby pool. I kid you not. Incredible. So, you know, it's unique experiences is what gets people chatting, right? It's what gets these millennials interested in wanting to engage. All right, so 
Uh, that gives you some of the truths of kind of what's happening with this millennial generation when it comes to marketing and connecting with them. So now let's talk a little bit some of the trends that we're seeing. Statistic number one, 40% of YouTube's video playback time is on a mobile device. Now I'm going to pause on this statistic because I think it's so crucial for two, for two reasons. Number one is video, right? Video, 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 video. Cisco estimates that by 2018, 79% of consumer internet traffic will be video. 79% by 2018. And I think that's right. I mean, as humans, right, we think in images. And if you had the option of watching a 50-second video versus reading text, more than likely you'd probably choose video. So in your marketing efforts, video, 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 video. Use video wherever you can. It's powerful, it's engaging, and it really starts getting the end user thinking and putting their mind into what does it look like to, to do business with you or experience your service. And then the second thing that's a big deal for this, in this statistic is mobile. Mobile, right? Mobile, 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 mobile. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But did you know 62% of all emails are first read on a mobile device? 62%. So technology, it's changing our behavior, right? And so we, we've got to start thinking about how does mobile affect um, our marketing. So we're going to dig in that a little bit deeper in a second. Uh, but this leads us to trend number one. There's a rising mobile and social content consumption. I don't know why I put my phone away. I need it right again for this, this example. I'm not texting one-handed, no looking, by the way. It's, it's, I'm not doing that. All right. Um, so we live in the stream economy now, I believe. The stream economy, right? All of us, we, we stream our news, stocks, sports, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, it's all feeds, right? And there's such a small window that we're gaining information. So for as marketers, there's a small window for you to get your message heard, right? But so mobile and social are a big deal. The best example I like to use in this is the Oreo ad. Who remembers seeing this ad? Uh, I bet more of you have seen this than you, than you think. So this ad right here was the most successful advertisement at the 2013 Super Bowl. This wasn't last year's Super Bowl where my Denver Broncos were embarrassed. So I, thanks for bringing that up, guys. Jeez. Um, so you guys remember 2013 Super Bowl? That's when the lights went out. Remember that? There was that blackout, and it was like 20 or 30 minutes that there was no lights. Well, when that happened, there was a group of Oreo marketers that were sitting in a room watching the game, and within four minutes, they created this. And this was a free twit, uh, tweet pick that they put out on the web, and it got more impressions than any of the multi-million dollar uh, commercials on, uh, um, during the Super Bowl. So hopefully you're understanding this trend that I'm trying to, to communicate here is that this, it, was, it was on a mobile device, right? The, the second or third screen experience, people were watching the Super Bowl, but yet they were still experiencing, um, you know, having experience on their, their mobile devices. So mobile and social, big, big deal. We'll talk a little bit about this later as well. All right. Trend number two, 63% of millennials stay updated on brands through social networks. Very social bunch. So this leads me to my, the next trend number two, context cultivates connections. Context cultivates connections. Some of you may be familiar with the, the, the phrase, content is king, but context is God, right? So let me kind of break this down for you. And the example I like to use is from a personal experience. So again, I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I grew up a hockey fan. But before we had the Colorado Avalanche, and I understand I'm in the south here, so hockey on ice, sticks, pucks. You guys with me? OK. Uh, and so before we had the Colorado Avalanche, which was the NHL team, I, I needed a team. I needed a team to ch cheer for. So I chose the Pittsburgh Penguins. Any Penguins fan? All right. Mario Lemieux, Yammer Yager, Tom Barrasso. I mean, that was the team. And so I was the biggest Mario Lemieux fan. He's pictured there in the top left there. <clears throat> so when I was in school and I, had to, I wanted to learn more about Mario Lemieux, what did I have to do? I had to go to the library, you know, walk over to the library, go, you know, fumble around for an hour, maybe find the right book, read it, physically read it, my goodness, <laughs> flip a page. Then I had to write my report, right, go to school, and then I would present it. But that's how I learned, that's how I started under, learning more about uh, the, the athlete that I wanted to choose and follow and become a fan of. 
So let's fast forward to today's uh, you know, marketplace and what social brings us. If someone wanted to become a super fan, a young fan of, of Russell Wilson, again, I don't know why I put Russell up there. He annihilated me in the Super Bowl. Come on, what am I doing? I'm, just, I'm self-inflicting here. But Russell Wilson, so if someone wanted to become a fan, what do you think, how do you think they'd get to know Russell Wilson today? Yeah, Google, they'd go to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, <clears throat> yeah. And so what, and, and he, you know, Russell Wilson does a great job of it. He's got a really robust Instagram. And so what, ha why these, you know, these young fans are going there, even today's fans, if you want to learn more about them, social media is really a window into who that person is, right? You create massive amounts of context around who you are as an individual through social. And, you know, we're humans. We want to connect with other humans, right? We want to have that connection. And so hopefully, you know, I use this example with individuals, but this, this happens with brands, right? Millennials are going through those social channels to learn more about you. I remember when I was trying to, uh, to uh, line up um, the DJ for, for my wedding, I, went, I didn't pick up the phone. Heck no, I'm a millennial. I'm not going to call somebody. Good grief. I don't even have my, phone, my the dial. I don't know what that is. So I didn't want to do any of that. So I, w I went to Facebook, I went to Twitter, and, I, and I, I gained a sense of how fun they were of a brand. What were some of the images? What did they look like when they were out and about? And, and how vibrant was it? How often were they um, contributing? And so that's how I chose to, to do business with that, um, that particular company. So this is an, an important and fundamental thing to understand, that social is not about the tools, it's about the reach. It's about creating context. And so I believe it's, we're seeing the humanization of brands. You know, the more personality you can put behind a brand, the more real and authentic and transparent you are, the more you'll win over with the millennial generation. Okay, trend number three, two and a half times or how much more likely millennials are to share a social media link that references a brand. So that leads us to the last trend, trend number three, infotainment over information. So infotainment is this hashing of a information and entertainment. Content that's entertaining sees engagement. So let me say that one more time. Content that entertains sees engagement. Think about the Oreo example that I did, right? People are already, you know, they're typically on social media a lot of times for entertainment purposes. So if you want engagement, if you want to get noticed, you have to uh, showcase some entertainment. And there's a, the best example I can, I can kind of really hammer home at this point is, is Amtrak. And I understand a lot of you probably can't read this from afar, but uh, Amtrak uh, posted this on Facebook, and this is like a year or so ago. But up there they said, here are two seats on our Silver Star. Tag who you would want to travel with you between New York and Miami. So it's a perfect blend of information and entertainment, right? They're showing you what their service looks like. They're telling you, hey, this is the Silver Star, and it runs from New York to Miami, so they're giving you some information, they're subtly telling you about their service, but then they're asking you to tag someone. They're, they're asking their, their fans to, to think, oh man, that would be fun to go on that trip, and who would I tag? So it, it created a lot of engagement. And Amtrak took it one step further, they started creating context, they began humanizing the brand when people started tagging people. A quick side note, again, if you tag somebody in that picture, it shares it with them, right? And so there's more sharing, more exposure that way as well. But someone actually tagged, and this was, again, this was like a year ago, back when this individual was actually hip and cool. Uh, someone tagged Justin Bieber. I want to go on a trip with Justin Bieber. Can you imagine today going on a trip with Justin Bieber? No thanks. <laughs> but, wow, yeah, that would be something. But Amtrak, so when someone posted Justin Bieber, they came back saying, that's great, but where would Selena Gomez sit? <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> But so, so the point is, Selena Gomez was Justin Bieber's girlfriend at the time. But it was a way to humanize the brand, right? So they didn't just post this thing and then walk away and people were engaging on it and they were involved. No, they were involved, they were invested, they were creating a fun experience all the time building their brand. So trend number three, infotainment over information. All right, guys, that wraps it up for the trends. So now let's step into some of the to-dos. Number one, get mobile. You all saw this coming, didn't you? Yeah. Hey, by the way, you guys are in Atlanta now, so I give you a free hall pass to say y'all. Okay? You, let's just say it real quick together on three. One, two, three. Y'all. It's the best thing. I'm not from the South, but I use it all the time. It's the best thing. Y'all. Okay. Um, so get mobile. Absolutely. Uh, and, and in fact, let me, 
the major point I want to make here is consider everything through the lens of mobile. And I want to give you some quick stats that are on my phone. Mobile stats on my mobile device, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so mobile stats. So number one, 70% of consumers delete emails immediately that don't render well on a mobile device. Okay? That, that's a big deal. 90% uh, of all text messages are read within three minutes. Pretty cool. So, you know, when you're texting your, your, your sons or daughters or co colleagues, they have no excuse. They saw it. They saw it three minutes ago, right? And then the last stat here, the open rate of text messages are 98% compared to 22% uh, to of emails. And that's a really interesting trend, right? How things are shifting. And again, remember, 62% of all of email is first open on a mobile device. So every email, every blog post, every sales page, every video, any content that you create, you have got to think about it through the lens of mobile, right? So I encourage all of you to hack your own marketing, right? Go to your website. I mean, all websites need to be mobile responsive. That is a table stakes these days. So hack your own marketing, you know, use your own marketing on yourself. How is the experience on a mobile device? How would a millennial, how, how, do they, how would they experience? What's that experience life? What's, what's painful? What's working? Because it's, it's crucial, right? We all have it. It's not within an, less than an arm's reach away at all times. Uh, so do your best to leverage it. All right. To do number two, get social. You all saw this one coming too, didn't you? Yeah, get social. So if you think about the, the trends, right? Creating context is easy on social. Uh, content consumption is happening through social. So if you can you know, add some value add, some more infotaining content, that's going to get consumed in social, especially the millennial generation. So my best advice here is create native, engaging, and authentic content. So let me break that down for us. Native. Hopefully, when you're, whatever platform, whatever social platform you decide to use, hopefully you're using the native, you're using native content for that platform. Right? If you have an image and you use Hootsuite or some other service to use that image and it posts on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, that's not as helpful as if you actually went to that platform and used what works in that platform. So, and for example, Facebook, Facebook will limit your reach if you post an image through any other third-party uh, service that posts on Facebook, Facebook recognizes that that didn't come natively from Facebook, and they'll limit the reach of that, of that post. So if you actually go to Facebook and post that image, you'll get uh, better results when you post natively in that, um, in that platform. So think about it, too. Uh, you know, we're all consumers of social, I, I, most of us, I'm sure, but we use are different platforms for different things, right? Facebook, we probably typically use it more for um, connecting with uh, friends or kind of staying updated with our world. Twitter is more maybe networking, consuming little bits of information. Instagram is just more creative. So, you know, this, this idea of just taking one piece of content and smattering it all over our, link, our, our uh, social platforms is not the best strategy. So think native. Secondly, engaging. Best example, right, Amtrak. How do, you create, how do you create content that's engaging? How do you get people talking um, and leaning into your brand? And then lastly, authentic. authentic. If you can put some person personality behind your brand, if you can make it seem like a real person is behind that brand, that'll speak volumes to the millennial generation. All right, our last to-do here is to get clear. I mean, I think you all agree, there's more clamoring for our attention than ever before, right? I mean, we're, we're also just, there's just so much content out there. It's just an overload, an avalanche of content. So you need to keep that in mind as you're marketing, right? Ha the, the content that's going to resonate is the stuff that cuts through the clutter. It's the simple, clear things. Um, and I think, uh, you know, creating simple and clear content is excruciatingly complex, right? Just try to write a mission statement. That is hard work, right? Trying to boil it down. But it's absolutely necessary that we create that clear and concise content. So my, my best advice here is simplify to amplify. So a couple strategies to think through. So next time you're creating an email or a sales page, a newsletter, blog post, whatever it may be, think about these three things. Number one, is it scannable? Is it scrollable? And is it skimmable? Again, we're all so, we have so much clamoring for our attention, so we've got to make it easy 
for our end users and our target market to consume the message that we're trying to send. So is it scannable, scrimmable, skimmable, or s uh, Yeah. That, that was gonna be my outro. I was gonna rip off my clothes and rock slide out to you guys. So, thanks for stepping on my punchline, guys. No, I wasn't gonna do that, so don't scratch that mental image out of your mind forever. Um, so again, make your content skimmable, scannable, scrollable. So use things, numbered lists, right? If you see a blog post and it says three ways to improve your you know, testing or whatever it may be, you're more apt to click on that article, right? Because there's a, a set number of things that you're gonna learn. So lists works well, bullets, uh, subheadings, headings, um, you know, bold text, right? And make sure your paragraphs aren't getting long. If I'm, a, if I'm a millennial and I pull out my mobile device and there's an email or a sales page and it covers the whole screen, it's just text, there's no way I'm reading that, right? I prefer it to be a video, but if it's not, I want it to be short, concise sentences, short paragraphs, bits of information that I can consume. So keep that in the back of your mind. Simplify to amplify when it comes to, to your marketing. All right, guys, um, that's it for the agenda. Um, let me check the time. I think we have time for some, yeah, we've got some time for some questions. So uh, before I get there, so think about your questions. Um, before I get there, though, I'm always, I want to stay connected, right? I'm a millennial. I want to connect. Um, but uh, I'm always trying to figure out how do I continue to add value outside these walls? How do I continue to add value to you guys, um, you know, beyond this hour that we have? Uh, so a couple of ways you can do that. Number one, if you go to ryan-jenkins.com, we post twice a week of blog. It's free blog, free content. Um, and it's all about how do you, how do you uh, market, lead, and communicate with the next generation. And we also do a bunch of like productivity hacks as well. Um, and then we also have a podcast where we interview some of the thought leaders in this space on how to market and connect with the generations. Uh, you can get the slides at ryanislive.com and then simply email me. If you don't feel bold enough to grab that mic minutes, just email me uh, your question or just to say, sup? And then <clears throat> finally, um, if you email me, and again, right, we want to get, we want to simplify to amplify. So if you email me and you just write free book, we'll send you a copy of our book, which is the Gen Edge Leveraging Millennials with a Next Generation Mindset. So all of that is for you guys. Hopefully today was helpful. Uh, thanks for having me. We're going to do some Q&A, and then I'm going to end with a, with a uh, quick story to wrap everything up. So we'll open it up to you guys. What questions do you have? Oh, and there's two mics in the middle, so you have a question. Do you mind walking over to the mic? I have just one follow-up question in regards to emails. So okay. one of the things that I found in higher ed is that, again, the emails tend to get long, so we've right. tried to really cut down the content. So what are your thoughts on the click-through, though? Um, because I need to, I still need to deliver them a little bit more information than what I can get in that little tiny <clears throat> short paragraph. Yeah. Are you finding that yep. they're willing to click through? Um, they're interested in clicking through, or should I just really, again, concentrate on getting my point across and hopefully my call to action is strong enough that they'll take the next step? Right. Yeah, so if you can't fit the um, entire email in the subject line, <laughs> right, so if that's not, if you can't do that, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point, because there are times when you need some content and to inform people. So I would say you got to lead with your best stuff, right? It's kind of like if you guys read articles, right? How do you get to the end of an article that you read on the web? It's usually because it starts with some good stuff, teases some things, gives you some follow-up points, and at the end, it really kind of wraps it up. So I would say if you're emailing, lead with your best stuff, but also lead with the action item. If you want someone to do something, say, hey, you know, get 20% off if you like this, or whatever it may be, right? Lead with that, and then tell them maybe why, and at the end, tell them how. So really, you want to frame it right away, give them the benefit right away, so they go, yes, I could use that, and then have that, they have that in the back of their mind as they're going through the rest of the content. It's probably the best strategy I can give you there. All right, guys, don't be shy. Don't be shy. What else? Good morning. Good morning. Um, a little background. Um, I'm about a year and a half into leading marketing for a big institution, uh, professional education. I come from the agency world where I was director of social media, so I know this stuff pretty well. Okay. Um, Did you want to come up and say some more? Like, no. No, no, no. Tag team it? 
okay. everything you said was fantastic. Okay, okay. Um, with that as my background and leading marketing at this new institution, I've made a decision that we don't have the resources or the time to staff social mm -hmm. media the way it should be done. Right, right. Like everybody, I'm sure. Yeah. So we have made, I have made the conscious decision that I'm going to shut most of it down and go all in on one platform so mm. that we can concentrate on doing it right. As soon as I write up the rationale and give it to my bosses who are more in some other generations, there's going to be some alarm, <laughs> right. to say the least. Right. Um, and they're probably going to wonder if I know what I'm doing. Of course, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. So how do you suggest people who are maybe, uh, I'm not a millennial, but close to that generation, have this experience, we know what we need to do as marketers. Mm -hmm. How do we sell the right decisions up? Right, yeah, great question. Um, and it, it is a tough, it's a tough balancing act, because I think there, there's, there's one strategy where you want to be everywhere, right? Because if you have uh, a target market or your user is going to go to Facebook, then they're going to go to Twitter, but oh wait, you're not on Twitter, you're not on Instagram, like, oh, you're just on Facebook? Um, so there's a strategy of be everywhere, which I think is helpful. I, I think people get caught up in being everywhere right away, and that might not be the best option. Be somewhere right away, drive some depth, and then you can perhaps start diversifying as well. Um, but you know, also too is you, you know, if you decide you want to start a blog, if you start a blog and you post a couple and then you walk away from it, and it, it, three, four months go by and you haven't put any content on your blog or uh, through Twitter or Instagram, whatever else, that speaks something, right? If I go to that and you've only posted twice, to me that, that, I, I, that doesn't build trust. To me, you, you started something and you couldn't follow through. So it's, a, it's important when we do jump into these, some of these strategies that we are all in and that we continue and follow through because if we don't, that speaks volumes as well. Um, but as far as selling it up, I, th I think you've, you've you know, it's all about numbers, and I still, people always tell, or usually it's, it's leaders um, that don't quite have their arms around social media that go, I don't understand the ROI of social media. And so a, a great follow-up question is, well, what's the ROI of your dog, right? I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't show you a, a chart of, you know, how happy my dog makes me, but it, it just, I, I love him. He makes me happy, right? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's this kind of the same thing that it, it's, it's, so you got to do your best, on, I guess, on painting the picture of if you do go all in on Facebook and it's going well, how can you, how can you benchmark that su success and, and present it to leadership, season leaders and executive management, whatever it may be, in a way that they understand it and then perhaps have a strategy on what, how to, step one would be to go to Twitter and here's our strategy, step two would be consider Instagram. Um, so I think that would probably be the best way to do it because it is sometimes, Folks glaze over, right? If social media, if they don't quite, if they're not in the marketing space like you guys are and don't quite understand the power of it. Um, so that'd probably be my best advice there. I hope that helps. All right. A few more. Probably two or three more, I assume. Yes. Oh my God, I feel so old. No. No. You're just, you're just wise. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes. I feel better now. Yeah. Uh, this is a conference about Adult Learners, right? University Professional Continuing Adult Association. Should it change its name yep. to University Professional Continuing Internet Association? I mean, do the millennials, from what you've described, and certainly we know, you know, we've heard and we've read, most of our focus is, is on non-traditional learners. And, and yeah. those of us that are old in the baby boomer uh, generation consider that folks like us, over 25, sure. on core careers. Can you tell us a little bit as you've done so well about their behavior uh, in terms of marketing, can you talk to us a little about their motivation and their thoughts about how they want to consume college education? We, I, we can mm. figure out it's internet-based and online, but right. part-time, never. Wh what are their thoughts about how, you know, MOOCs, what, what, how do they yeah. consume college? Yeah, MOOCs, I think, is, is, you know, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg with, with MOOCs. I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is a generation that grew up... Um, we talk about millennials, it's from 14 to 34. So that is a, you know, typically generations are done in 20 year spans, which is, I think is outdated. I'm not the guy that, that created that <laughs> system. But a 14 year old is extremely different than a 34 year old, right? So <laughs> that's gone out the window. And why it's, it should go out the window is because generations are created by pivotal moments in develop, developmental years that they experience, right? Whether it be something they see on TV, 
you know, whether it be whatever it may be. So the, so the millennial generation, they have access to the world, right? YouTube, they can see anything. So they're developing at a much faster rate in, in some regards. So really, I believe the generation should be split into two, maybe even three categories. But what I hope you get out of this is, is that these are, these are trends. So the millennial generation, this is their thought process. And a lot of that is changing other thought processes. I bet a lot of you, if I ask you, I won't, I, won't allow, I won't ask you to do this, but how many of you said you'll never be on Facebook? You know, how many of you would raise your hand? Oh, some of you are actually raising your hand. That's cool. Yeah. And then how many, and if I followed up that question, how many of you now have a Facebook account? I bet most of you would, right? I know so many people that said that. So a lot of the behaviors that we're stepping through, yes, it's based in, 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 in uh, uh, and I'm going to get to your question. I'm giving some context here is uh, really rooted in millennials, but I think so much of that behavior is just spilling over to other generations. Uh, the, I forget the exact statistic, but the, the average age uh, of a person that takes a selfie is in their mid-40s. And it's, <laughs> not kidding you, and it's typically women. So we're, <laughs> it's interesting, right? And so we think selfie, we think, oh, millennials. So, all right, yeah, yeah, chew on that one for a little bit. Okay, so, so back to your question, yes. And so I think all the stuff that we're talking about, it's creating new environments, it's creating new expectations. And so MOOCs, I think, is the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, we're seeing stuff with Georgia Tech right here in our backyard here in Atlanta. Um, instrumental, all right, yes. <laughs> um, so we're going to start seeing more of that stuff because this is a generation that grew up in the age of customization. They want to be able to customize their career track. They want to be able to customize their learning. They want options. But then they also want to couple that with meeting the professors. And that might not mean physically meeting, but maybe some time over Skype or whatever else it may be. Um, so I think we are just scratching the surface. I think MOOCs is, is, a, is an amazing idea. I also think the flipped classroom is also an amazing point, too, where we can go and get the information we need you know, on the web, on a video, or whatever it may be, and then go into a physical environment and interact with people, learn from them, gain different experiences, help each other. Um, I think that's going to have extreme uh, value moving forward. Hopefully that's helpful. I think we had a question over here. All right. Oh, nice. I think this will, this will be the last question. If anyone else, again, email me or um, just come up and chat with me afterwards, maybe. Okay, I'll try to be concise in yeah, this no, last sure. question. Um, so you, when you were talking about millennial habits, it does seem that that extends to a lot of other generations, millennials being early adopters. Um, and where we're coming from um, at my university, is I work with the continuing education department. So our um, target demographic tends to be a bit older, and I actually handle our social media. So what I have the issue with is being a millennial myself, I understand that authenticity is important, all these mm -hmm. things. Um, but it's radio silence out there on Twitter, on, well, Facebook, of course, has no reach, um, on LinkedIn, on YouTube. And now we're moving to Instagram. So did you have any advice for um, uh, drawing people in? Because right now, you know, contests aren't working, the hashtags aren't working. Mm -hmm. um, it's like they're not there. And I don't know if it's because that's not our audience and they're not on there or yeah. what is going on? Yeah, good point. I mean, again, it's, it's getting more and more cluttered out there. I mean, we used to live in this land of milk and honey, the early days of social media, right? It was like you could put something on Facebook and everybody saw it and everybody shared it, right? It's getting harder and harder to gain followers. It's harder and harder to reach those people. So I'm not sure if I've got a silver bullet for you, but it just takes coming to conferences like these and start talking with peers, what's working, what's not, what's your demographic. What's... So I, I think contests are helpful. Um, I think another big strategy would be to s survey. Survey your target market and say, what channels are you using? How are you using them? What would be helpful? I mean, you know, a lot of us were connected to a lot of our target market or potential, and offering up a survey would be s super easy, and, and maybe you get a, you know, half the people or a fourth of the people respond, but that's more data that you have than you did when you didn't do the survey. So I think you just need to start asking that. Start being a student of your own, own experiences on your mobile device and through social. You know, what are you looking for? What causes you to stop over an ad, you know, to consume that information? You know, why do you click on a link? What is it that, that made you click on that? And so really become a student of your own behavior, I think, goes a long way as well. Um, but it is. It's becoming harder and harder and harder. So we've just got to be really open, start asking questions, 
don't rest on your laurels, right? Continue to innovate and think and, and push the envelope, I think is really the best environment because it's constantly changing, right? Um, all right, guys, I got a quick story for you, and I'll, I'll, this is going to be a, a, um, just a quick little story and a quick, it's on my phone, by the way, I'm not checking email. Um, so a quick public speaking or, you know, meeting tip, if you're, if you're, don't ever end with questions and answers because you never know where it's going to go. You know, you could just get a terrible question and end on that. What a flop. So always have, always have a backup story or something to kind of bring it all together. Okay, that, that was a free tip for you guys. Okay. So how many of you are feeling like this little dude? Right? Whoa, a lot going on. This is crazy, right? Ah, I'm stressed. Well, I, good. I, I say I'm glad that you're overwhelmed because I think all of us, we need to, we need to figure out how to operate in, the, in a state of overwhelmingness, right? Because it's not going to, social media is not going to go away. We're not going to start getting less emails, right? We're going to start getting more, right? We're going to keep being overwhelmed. So to, to be able to function and thrive through this cluttered world that we live in, I think is crucial. Um, so I want to give you a story. All the undercurrent to all of my presentations that I do is change, right? Change is coming. How do we get ready for it? Here's some tips and hacks to, to, to prepare. Um, so I'll, this last story, I think, really sums up the five phases of change. So as I read this short story, I want you to start thinking in your mind, where are you in this change process? And this could be in any aspect of your life, but I think this will hopefully add some value. Because again, change is the only constant that we have in today's culture, right? Crazy. All right, so this, the story is called Autobiography in Five Short Chapters by Portia Nelson. Has anybody heard this before? Yes, you're in for a treat. Okay, chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes me forever to find a way out. Phase one of change is ignorance. Chapter two, I walk down the street. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Phase two of change is self-deception. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there, but I still fall in. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I hope today your eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. Whoa, big deal. Ownership. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Phase three of change is surrender. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. How about that? Huh? Phase four is adjustment. And then the last chapter, last phase, is I walk down another street. Thank goodness. So phase five of change is freedom. So guys, thanks for having me. I hope that you and your teams find your new streets, and I hope you decide to walk boldly down them. Thanks, guys.